Development Commission meeting of March uh, 4th. It is now 8.30, 4 a.m. Uh, we have on the line uh, Chairman Kevin Lesko. We have Commissioners uh, Don Peterson, Elise Fatherly, Steve Rosado, John Slavin, uh, David Foley. And did I miss anyone? I believe we also have uh, Beverly Ballas from the Chamber of Commerce, and we have our guest presenters, uh, Jim Went and Emmeline Harrigan. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, take it away. Excellent. Very good. Well, uh, uh, welcome to each of you. Uh, uh, good Thursday morning. And what I'd like to do is uh, first, uh, Jim, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, I would like to uh, call the meeting to order by uh, uh, having an approval of the minutes uh, from the past uh, meeting. Uh, do I have a second on that, please? Uh, Dan Peterson, second to motion. Please, fatherly, second to motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Yay. Okay. All right. I think Mark will will take that as a yes. Mark, do you, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we all know uh, Jim pretty well. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, done such a great job for our, our, our town over the years, and I, we've all come to know him. Uh, but I think uh, if you'd like to kind of cue him up a little better than, uh, than that, you go right ahead. Well, you're right, uh, Mr. Lesko, uh, a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> Our planning director, Jim Wen, is, uh, was kind enough to uh, join us today, as well as uh, Emmeline Harrigan from the Planning and Zoning Department. Um, we are uh, in the midst of updating our plan of conservation development. We kind of got a little bit sideways with the uh, pandemic, and uh, but I know they're hard at work uh, uh, trying to uh, continue this process of updating our master plan, so I thought it would be appropriate for Jim to provide a, a brief update to the commission as to where things stand, where we're heading, and you know some key issues um, that the commission may consider as it relates to economic development. So, Jim, go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Can 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 you hear me? Yes. All right. Can. I'm going to um, attempt to share my screen. So bear with me for a second here. Hopefully this will work. I'm. Uh, we're going to go. Uh oh. <laughs> It worked just a minute ago, Jim. <laughs> I know, I know. I knew I shouldn't have tried this. You want me to go ahead, Jim? Yeah, if you could, yes. If That might be easier if, you, if you've got it. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're gonna, I thought before we go forward, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go backwards a little bit. So, um, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, all this morning. And thank you for the opportunity, Mark. Um, so again, Jim Went, we have been embarking on the update for the plan of conservation development for a couple of years now, and some of you have been uh, deeply involved in that effort already. Uh, you may recall, uh, and you in a joint effort between the Planning and Zoning Commission and this board, we did a TOT planning study, and I wanted to refresh a couple of the findings from that before we talk about some of the uh, POCD um, issues. Uh, you can go to the next slide in line, thanks. And I apologize for having to, uh, <laughs> that I couldn't get that on the screen. So again, the, the TOD plan was adopted in October of 2019, and again, was a effort with this board. And some of the findings and the takeaways that we learned from that uh, endeavor was that mixed use, uh, there was a lot of concern and, uh, and anxiety about high density residential and what that means in terms of town services and taxes, but the study uh, in depth found that uh, basically multifamily housing provides a comparable net tax revenue to office space, uh, which is a critical, um, critically important. So we can go to the next slide, please. And so during that study, um, there were some key questions that we talked about. What's, what's the uh, office and retail market looking at and, and how does uh, housing fit into this, especially with regard to our downtown and uh, Metro Center? I yep. have a question in the chat just to define what POCD and TOD is. Okay. Um, TOD is an acronym for transit oriented development. And in the, in the next couple, uh, in about three more slides, I will get into the POCD definition and what that means. POCD again is an, an acronym for plan of conservation and development, which in 
days days of old uh, used to be referred to as the town's master plan. Now uh, the statutes refer to it as a plan of conservation and development. So thank you. We'll, we can go to the next slide. So from that transit oriented development um, study, we we could we could advance. Here we go. Let's see some of the key takeaways for market office market potential. Uh, our consultants thought that downtown was best positioned for 10 to 20,000 square feet of office space over the next 10 years. And the Metro Center had a higher potential, but before that could happen, and as we have seen, nothing's happened, uh, that there needs to be a stronger mixed use setting before there would be a, attractive for an office tenant. So we are working hard to try to produce that bigger uh, mixed use setting to create more there, there, if you will, to create the demand for office space uh, in that location. Next, please. So the takeaways for dining and retail, these should be well familiar to you as you all live this as well, that, that downtown Fairfield is a regional destination for dining. We have really become a dining uh, and, and hub. Our core downtown uh, is strong for community retail. We're not particularly, uh, we don't have a huge regional retail draw, but we're, we're uh, very strong with respect to community retail and mixed use. And, and with respect to Metro Center, with the additional residential development in, in creating more uh, dining and eating establishments would help uh, create potential market. Next, please. This cover slide now uh, is kind of the start of it all. Plan of conservation development again is, is uh, and we can go to the next page that a little walk you, walk you through that. So what is a, a POCD or plan of conservation development? It's really a goals and policy document. It's a snapshot view of the town in its aspirations uh, for land use policy. Um, where should we be going? What are our needs? Um, what are our priorities? And it's 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 a policy document. It's not a regulation. The planning and zoning regulations, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the regulatory document. And after a POCD is generally adopted, uh, the next step is to go back and look at the regulations and see if we. Uh, what adjustments need to be made in the regulations so th that would implement the goals and strategies that we identify in the plan. Um, so, a regular, you know, so it's the plan itself is the goal and aspiration document. The planning and zoning regulations is the regulatory scheme of how we can direct potential development uh, to achieve the goals that we've identified in the POCD. So we can go to the next uh, slide. So about a year ago, uh, we did some winter workshops in many of you, I think, uh, may have been involved. Uh, and we had three very well attended workshops around town to to kind of ask the questions. What what's what's important to you? Um, and, you know, this was, again, pre COVID. So we were all able to gather in a fairly close proximity it was it was before uh, the rise of the uh, racial and social awareness issues that we've um, that have come to the fore in the last year or so prominently and and it was just a kind of a reassessment of what do we need uh, in our in our neighborhoods so we can go to the next slide so those workshops were centered on three main topics where we asked for feedback uh, the first being conservation issues in terms of open space and recreational needs the second being economic development and housing to talk about, um, you know, where growth uh, areas should be, uh, where we are in housing and so forth. Uh, in, the, in the last uh, was infrastructure. And, you know, having been doing this for a while, and, and many of you likewise, it's, it's always, the tension is always, well, let me back up a second. When you, when you ask a, a, our citizenry, what are the two main important things that the town needs to do? And we saw this with the uh, public outreach through the, with the, the effort that the Strategic Plan uh, Commission undertook and similar feedback that we get constantly. It's consistent. The number one issue that people always raise is we need more development to offset the tax burden for our citizens. In the second, <laughs> in contrast to that is we need to stop overdevelopment. So those are always the top two uh, uh, pieces of feedback that we get is we need more development to offset taxes. 
and we need to stop overdevelopment. So obviously those are uh, conflicting goals um, in the trick, in the task for us and for you and for all the boards is, is how do we balance those conflicting uh, goals? How do, how do we best target investment in order to achieve tax revenues to lessen the burden of our residential citizens? And at the same time, do it in a fashion that people are comfortable with, that they don't think we're changing uh, the underlying character and look of the town. So that's that's the challenge. That's the needle we're trying to thread <laughs> through this whole process. Um, and, and, and it's consistent. And it's been that way for years. You know, that same tension exists in most communities. And we see that pendulum shift back and forth over time uh, towards a, a pro-development uh, pro public discourse versus uh, an anti-development if you will i don't want to necessarily couch it in those extremes but but that's where we're trying to uh, trying to fit uh what are the best ways to do this uh, so everybody can be comfortable with where we're heading so we can go to the, the next slide so we're going to concentrate on what the feedback that we received on the economic development piece and what we did is we went through a series of exercises where folks gathered at tables and, and we elicited feedback and, and what the bullet points are here is people actually wrote on maps. They, you know, we gave them time to work. And, and these are the things that rose up as issues uh, from, from that feedback. So people want to extend streetscape improvements at Kings Highway all, you know, down to the Commerce Drive area. There was some discussion that maybe we, you know, we need to take a closer examination of how the commercial looks or commercial areas look between our downtown and Southport, and maybe we can have a greater level of uh, connectivity before those things. There's interest in promoting uh, hotel use, and um, and I know that some of us have been promoting, particularly our uh, first select woman is interested in trying to get a rooftop bar uh, dining opportunity somewhere uh, in our in our, uh, in our business area. Um, you know, there, there's, there was an appetite for increased density of commercial development in our downtown uh, in terms of height uh, and, and mixed use. Um, people are looking for uh, greater design standards for commercial buildings. They, again, an appetite to allow a little bit more downtown in an area, you know, we have a very vibrant downtown, um, you know, for dining in, in entertainment and folks uh, are looking for uh, greater opportunities, in, in, including uh, encouraging apartments. We do, we do have a handful of apartments downtown, but there's certainly an appetite and acceptance uh, for more of that. There was some discussion, uh, and I think if you've seen the strategic plan release, the, the strategic plan folks agree uh, with these comments we received publicly. There was some discussion about maybe we ought to promote a, a marina or a restaurant or some commercial activity down on a marina area. Uh, to activate the uh, waterfront, and that could be a potential revenue opportunity. Uh, we can go to the next slide. With respect to our train station areas, you know, the the what we found in the transit-oriented development study is there's, by and large, a greater acceptance for more uh, in the metro center area. That's the area that folks generally agree. If we do larger, bigger buildings. Uh, it's not going to have the same level of impact as it would because there's no real uh, surrounding residential neighbors there that would be as impacted. It's 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 redevelopment. It's our industrial core uh, that was a real industrial base of of employment back in the 40s and 50s, in in beyond. And now it's it's an area that needs to be redeveloped. So that's that's really the target opportunity for the greatest level of investment um, for more. Downtown, there was some talk uh, in some discussion about whether or not there ought to be a public partnership, a private public partnership, potentially with the development of, of the train station lot. Uh, is that lot, can that lot be put to a greater use than just commuter parking? Uh, and what's the right way to do that? Uh, you know, the challenge with that, as you all I'm sure have discussed, is, you know, there's some infrastructure limitations. Uh, in that area in terms mainly with the railroad crossings, you know, Mill Plain Road underpass, it's a very restrictive traffic uh, reduction um, issue. And so uh, in order for development to really have its full potential, I think we need to look at ways to improve or expand that traffic um, 
capability. But these are some of the comments again we we got from feedback. The, the checks, the check marks mean that they, they were like repeated comments that people had from groups from the various groups that there was some appetite to consider a downtown parking deck development. Um, and that's repeated in a couple of different ways here. Um, uh, opportunity for multifamily, and we see some of those things already happening. You know, the former Knights of Columbus property is is now emerging and, and almost uh, nearing occupancy of a 90 unit project uh, that's going to add some more feet on the street uh, downtown. So we can go to the next um, slide. So aside from the targeted train station area, some of the other general commercial comments that people had uh, is, you know, considering some pop-up events, some food truck areas, um, or, and, and we already do have some summer, um, you know, farmer's markets, but maybe a, a, a summer restaurant down at, at, down at the marina, or a, um, you know, community stage or something to activate areas uh, or opportunities to get more people out uh, and about in, in our downtown. Um, promoting pedestrian pedestrian friendly priorities is 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 certainly a, a high priority um you know improving the pedestrian environment east and west we have a pretty good core of streetscape improvements in our downtown and i think there's some interest in potentially expanding those east and west uh, to make the pedestrian walking environment a little better obviously there's still strong desire for our downtown to have street fronting retail um with no parking that's you know as, as a historic downtown it's nice that the buildings are all up near the street and, and folks like to see that continue uh there was some discussion about in our black rock turnpike corridor that maybe there could be alternative access ways behind some of those larger uh commercial centers to so if you're going to multiple uh places uh, on a trip of Black Rock Turnpike, you, you don't have to keep coming in and out of Black Rock Turnpike. You might be able to uh, traverse uh, through some of those commercial areas rather than keep entering and exiting uh, Black Rock Turnpike itself. Um, there was some discussion and some appetite for potentially creating some new uh, commercial areas, maybe a village district or small commercial area up north by uh, Sacred Heart University potentially. Uh, in, in some discussion of the Greenfield Hill Village Center and maybe you know, having some residential opportunities there. I will say that the, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission a couple of weeks ago approved the conversion of one of the two office buildings up on Bronson Road to be eight uh, apartment units. So there is some movement. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And so housing, um, you know, is part of economic development. And so uh, we are about to embark uh, with, uh, with the assistance and, and, and collaboratively with the Affordable Housing Committee um, in uh, another effort that Mark was able to cobble together some money for us to help uh, you know, bring in a consultant to update the affordable housing plan. But housing, affordable housing, is is, is an important part of uh, uh, an overall economic development strategy. I think everyone would agree. The slide, you know, the, the map on the right is where we have existing uh, accessory apartments. We can go to the next slide. So the question about diversification of housing is, is some that there was, uh, in some of these things you may have read, and in, in, in as, because it takes a long time to implement and produce a, a plan of conservation development. Sometimes goal issues that where there's common agreement uh, move faster than the plan itself. So there was uh, strong, you can see by the number of check boxes uh, on the upper left there, uh, strong consideration for the idea of allowing detached structures to be considered for accessory dwelling units. In, in through the work of the Affordable Housing Committee at Fairfield Senior Advocates, there was a recent amendment proposal adopted by the commission to help reduce barriers to entry to uh, accessory apartments. So while the plan itself will have these uh, goals uh, embedded, we're already kind of moving towards implementation of some of these things, even as the plan um, continues. So, Oh, and the overall housing uh, goals that we heard that uh, there was some desire to reduce housing density in the McKinley School area, the eastern part of town, which is our densest uh, development uh, area. Uh, I didn't want to go, let's see. Um, 
you know, there's there's broad acceptance to to fund uh, affordable housing, uh, and as you know, or probably know, uh, the town has established a, a, an affordable housing um, fund for which development fee are deposited. So, and that's an opportunity to help create uh, opportunities for town uh, investment in creating units. There was, you know, again. New two family houses, there, there's some pushback about that. That's become a, a more popular way to develop in our, in our denser zones. And some people are getting a little anxious about that. So they want us to take a, a harder look at that opportunity and reduce density uh, in the flood zones in general. Um, we can go to the next slide. So after we had these meetings at the end of each meeting, these were these vertical columns were the uh, topics that we engaged folks with, and we asked them to rate where they thought we needed additional targeted public outreach. And the three in the yellow were the areas that got the most votes that, that we needed more uh, broader discussion on it would be uh, open space, recreation, housing, and, and economic development. So um, if we go to the last, I think it's the last slide, the next slide is our, our next steps is is um and as you've probably heard from mark that he was able to get some funding and we've gone out with uh he's gone out with an rfp for a consultant to update the town's affordable housing plan and we are uh looking to use that opportunity to leverage a a the next round of uh, of public outreach on housing specifically so it will both It'll do two things. It'll it'll will update the affordable housing plan and also inform our planning and cons plan and conservation development efforts around the topic of housing in particular, uh, so we can get a little more focused discussion on that. So we see that as that's our next, as Mark said earlier, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic has kind of hampered our effort to really do effective public engagement because while it's okay and, and we've been doing okay doing planning and zoning commission meetings and uh on this type of forum where people can uh, participate in a hearing, it's it's harder to do a tabletop type exercise and get folks talking together uh, in groups to get more meaningful feedback. So we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, engage in that uh, in the not too distant future, but looking forward to the opportunity uh, with working with the Affordable Housing Committee um, in the broader public uh, to get um, some directed um, feedback on, on a housing plan going forward. And then obviously we'll have to continue uh, engaging with this board uh, in the Planning and Zoning Commission in terms of some more focused um, economic development strategies that we can uh, fold into our plan. So that's kind of snapshot view of, of where we are, uh, where we've been in, in our next steps going forward. And, uh, and Emmeline and I and Mark are happy to try to answer any questions you guys might have. We can. Oh. There you go, Jim. Uh, could you give us an update on a on a few of the projects that are going on right now? I uh, sure. I, I know that on Black Rock Turnpike, there's one that's kind of heating up right now. Uh, on uh, on on Beach Road, there's another another project. Uh, and then, uh, could you give us an update on the former GE property, the this, the new Sacred Heart piece south, about what they're doing there? Sure. Well, pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission now is, is an application at 4185 Black Rock Turnpike, the old plant factory site across from the high hole. That's a 94 unit. You, uh, you may recall that a, a couple of years ago that was approved for about 30,000 square feet of medical office. That never happened. The I think Norwalk Hospital at the time was the prospective tenant. They kind of backed out their interest as things contracted. Um, and so that never went forward. So now on the on effectively the same development footprint of what was to be a medical office building is now proposed a 94 unit uh, residential <laughs> building uh, under um, the affordable housing statute, which requires 30% of those units to be below market rate. Um, so I forgot what the second issue, the GE. Oh. Oh. So that was uh, that was the front parcel. There's a back parcel too, is there not? No, there, there's no application pending for the larger upper parcel, which is very, uh, I call the top of the rock, if you will. It's a very, it's it's a it's a very rocky, steep 
uh, environment. There was a plan floated, I think, before the Water Pollution Control Authority a year or two ago that, to to test the sewer capacity, but there's no pending application there. Okay. Um, the Commission Planning Zoning Commission recently approved a, uh, a 3,600 seat capacity hockey arena at uh, the Sacred Heart University West Campus, former GE site. Uh, I think that's going to be uh, an exciting opportunity if they can catch lightning in a bottle like uh, Quinnipiac did in terms of interest in in hockey. I think that's another you know interesting uh, opportunity. Uh, and there's going to be some public tie-in. Uh, for use of that space for the high school, for high school hockey um, in, in recreational use. So they've pledged to <clears throat> create ice time and allow our high school hockey programs uh, to utilize that facility as well. Jim, there's, there is a strip uh, along uh, Eastern Turnpike that they also kind of talked about developing, and maybe that was in regards to what you were saying about maybe adding a village or, or commercial development. Uh, in in that upper area, is that what you were referring to? Well, we floated the idea in in the public outreach. We wanted to kind of put that out there as a question to see how folks would react to it, to see if there would be pushback or acceptance to the idea. And you know, it wasn't super strong. People didn't throw their hands up and say no. Don't even consider that. There was some uh, buy-in to hey, maybe that's not a bad idea if there's going to be that uh density of student population up there that maybe uh it's not a bad idea to have some supporting retail um you know for those and whether it's eastern turnpike or park avenue or wherever that may be uh that's something that we need to have you know some some additional dialogue on i think my understanding on that was that the development that they would do would be a taxable portion of it uh, for that kind of commercial it was that I think we had that conversation when we were up there at a uh, at a meeting up on that site. They talked about maybe producing four to six hundred thousand dollars of of, of uh, 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 annual tax uh, from that development. I'm just wondering if that was something that they were if it's a, still if it's, an, if it's a non-educational use, then it would be taxable. Yes. Right. Okay. Super. All right. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. David, David. A couple questions, if you don't mind. Um, and I'm learning here. I'm the new newbie and, and not an expert in, in town government. So appreciate your patience. Uh, first question is how many people participated in those forums that you mentioned? We had, um, I think the largest one. There, there, there were three. There, one we used Fairfield University and Sacred Heart University as venues, and the third was at Penfield Pavilion. Um, so I think our largest uh, attendance was probably 80, 85 folks or so at Penfield, and we had probably 40 to 50 at, at each of the others. Okay, yeah. I mean, help me understand. This is where I'm learning, right? I'm, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you know. It seems like it, I'm all for public input, right? But it it seems like it should be the government setting the priorities, coming up with the plan, then going to the public and saying, "Here's what we think," as you know, elected <laughs> officials and experts like you, what we think the priorities should be. And you elected us in the case of the first elect woman to do this. What do you think? I mean, I'm not saying don't get feedback, but drawing, I mean, it makes me a little nervous drawing conclusions from in terms of what the public thinks from a forum of 40, 50, or even 80 people. I mean, I, for example, I, I would, I have pretty strong thoughts about this, but I, either didn't know about the forum or certainly I couldn't attend, but I have trust that when I went to the voting booth, I elected someone who shared those priorities. So, and, and again, I'm just trying to understand, I'm not being critical, but in terms of process, it just makes me nervous to, you know, because people have strong views about affordable housing or economic development. Mm -hmm. And those people might, who are passionate might show up and then you walk away with an impression well, we should be doing this or that, but 
that's just a minority of people. It's not the. So anyway, mm -hmm. how do you react to that? I'm curious. Just to chime in, I, I participated in a couple of those, and it was led by a group of consultants that sort of walked you through it. So it wasn't just left sort of free form. And okay. it was, there was, you know, sort of they gave you a background, what you're trying to accomplish, and they just aggregated the ideas. It wasn't necessarily like that something could surface from there to drive the agenda, if you will. It was just giving people a chance to voice their concerns more than anything else where it was aggregated again. So if something was specifically um, concerning to people that would have risen to the top, uh, I don't think that is what drove the agenda or the outcome. Um, it just reflected people's participation is my opinion. Yeah, I might, I, I, I might add that I it, it, it might have mitigate, it might mitigate some of those, those strong passionate people later on as some of these things were being implemented. I think, I think the, the general goals uh, of what was needed was was still achieved, but I think it gave people that that were passionate about maybe not wanting it to have a little voice and maybe a better understanding. I, I thought it was actually a very good forum. Yeah, and I and I appreciate the the, the comments. And, and there's always, you know, some tension there. And and when we do this, you know, we have some ideas of where we think we want to go and what we want to get feedback on. So as Steve said, you know, it's not just a um, you know, a free for all, if you will, and maybe I don't want to couch it that way, but by, by the same token, if we're trying to implement change, I mean, the regulations and our, and our recommendations say one thing, um, but it, it, it's important to get feedback on certain uh, areas where you want to go. And the best example I can give you is when we did the, you know, even before we did the, the TOD planning, before that, uh, you know, we did a pretty broadly attended study uh, for the Commerce Drive area in anticipation of the Metro Center development when everybody knew the train station was coming and we knew it was going to be a catalyst for investment. How did we want to target that? And we had a very, uh, again, similar process where we tested options, tested ideas, and there was great uh, large buy-in to doing more in, in so the regulations were changed to allow a 70 foot height, a 80% residential 50 bedroom per acre density where, where that, was, when you say those numbers, sounds like a lot. Uh, and, and there was a lot of public dialogue about that and, and ultimately consensus uh, was achieved. And you have to remember that, you know, the Planning and Zoning Commission, they're, they're elected. Elected officials like to know that we're, that there's some kind of uh, broad-based support behind uh, the ideas that they want to try to put forward. And by the time we went through that process, we did the planning, we adopted the plan, adopted the regulations, the two largest development projects that the town has seen in the last 30 years, in my view, uh, the two trade, you know, the trademark one was 101 unit uh, development with commercial on the first floor and the second being 160 units with even more commercial space were approved unanimously by the commission with very little, um, um, if any, that I can recall, uh, opposition publicly when we had those public hearings. There, there were a lot of people that came in support. Hey, we did the, you know, we did the planning work, we did the background, we asked, um, we asked for the feedback, and by the time we got to implementation, uh, those two projects uh, were approved unanimously without any kind of controversial hearings. And so that's why I think it's important to get. The feedback, but I agree with you. It's not the end all. Um, you know, there needs to be some direction in in, in where we're going. Uh, but uh, the idea on the feedback is to kind of test to test ideas, um, not not to necessarily, you know. And and you're absolutely right. This isn't a referendum. Uh, you know, the development applications are are not a referendum. They're 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 based on our regulatory scheme. We're just trying to get input on uh, where there's some support to 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 push that. You know. I think uh, to, to David's point, I, I know that there are a couple of, of uh, situations in the past. One, I recall the Stratfield market and the other, I think there was going to be an, an older age home um, by Blackrock Turnpike where there were open forums because it was more testing the waters rather than sort of just moving forward where the public sort of put a stop to it, right? And I guess, I guess the thought process is, you know, what happens if you feel like you're moving forward and you have momentum and all of a sudden you run into a brick wall like that. What is, what, what, what's the process of, of overcoming? Or do you give in to the voice of, of the people having that, that time in a forum, which may be a minority, 
maybe it's the local community. Um, it's, I don't think we're going to see that in the location that you're talking about for a lot of obvious reasons from a residential perspective. Um, but, you know, just wondering if it could create, you know, just gridlock and, and potential put a stop to something that may be good, maybe not good. Well, I, I, you know, there's there's always on any individual development application, you know, there's always a uh, um, the opportunity for folks that disagree to rise up in 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 opposition. You know, and we see again broadly, you, you poll everybody in town or on the street corner and say, do you think uh, you, would you do you support uh, increased economic uh, investment in the town to help offset taxes? You'll say yes. Uh, you know, until it's a development that's anywhere near you, and then it's no, you know. So the the, the <laughs> so there, there's always uh, that uh, opportunity. But if someone is going forward with a development that's consistent with, you know, the goals that have been set forth in the planning process, then it's then it then it's easier. That then the decision makers, the the commissioners, have the backup to rely on say in in the face of public opposition of a particular project they can step back and say listen look at the bigger picture we've done this work we've gotten the feedback uh, these are the things that we thought there were community consensus on and this plan is consistent with that so we're going to go forward uh, even though some of you uh you know may not agree that this particular project uh, is the right option i mean to that can point can i just add something yeah. really quickly jim the, um, you know, I think I think one of the reasons why we did all the workshops with maps was, and especially the economic development portion, was to really emphasize that 95% of the land in Fairfield is zoned residential. Um, we really have very uh, limited opportunities uh, within our commercial districts because they are so small. Um, so we really kind of tried to express to people you know, that we heard them, we understand that they feel this increasing tax burden is becoming problemsome. Um, but we also really tried to educate people in terms of looking at what the reality was in Fairfield and kind of step them back and say, if you really want economic development that helps kind of displace some of the tax burden, we do need to focus in this very, these very limited corridor opportunities that we have available to us. And here's how we could do that. So it wasn't, you know, you do kind of have to provide the, the public with some understanding as to what that means, even in the simple things that affect their everyday life. For example, if you live in North Fairfield, it's gonna take you 15 to 20 minutes to go drive and get a bagel in, you know, in the areas right now where you have commercial opportunities available to you. So that was part of what we talked about in terms of what, it, what affects their everyday life, in terms of, you know, if we were to, um, you know, institute a commercial, a, a very limited, um, you know, commercial corridor up by the university, which would, you know, provide some opportunities for the university students, but also for people now who have to drive 15 minutes to get a bagel. Yeah, I think that's an important point in terms of maximizing the opportunities since we just, just don't have much commercially viable land. But the other point I was going to make was uh, in terms of attracting investment, investors, developers don't like uh, or try to minimize uncertainty and risk. And to the extent to which we can fill in the gaps and give them some some sense that their project or idea will be positively received and help speed that process along, that, that augurs well for further investment and, and development activity. So we do try to at least get a sense of, you know, we have an idea of certainly where those development opportunities present themselves and what might potentially work. But it's good to test the waters too, as Jim mentioned, to, to um, make sure we have consensus around those those common themes. Uh, this is Dan. Um, to hey, David's Dan. point, I would say, having gone to most of those uh, meetings and training yeah. sessions is that the people that go to that tend to be the advocates. And if, if you've been to those, you know that whether it's about almost any part of town, the pedestrian and bike advocates usually show up. And if uh, the affordable housing advocates show up. And so you, there's a sense that the supporters come out to voice their opinions. And then when it winds up at a public hearing, the planning and zoning, then all the neighbors come and 
make it sound like, well, that's not their view of the world, as, as uh, Jim had mentioned when he started out. So I think there is some validity to say that um, it's a small sample size that comes out mm -hmm. and you do get a, a reasonable cross-section of mm -hmm. people, but it's generally the advocates that come or else people like me that are um, serving on a board or a commission that just want to sense, you know, get a sense of the people's uh, view of things. So help in, inform our decision-making process when a developer comes in and pitches a deal. So that's my two cents. Uh, Jim or Emmeline, uh, uh, speaking to the, uh, the POCD, the, the map itself that's being created uh, for purposes of commercial properties, the, the, the new one, so to speak, would, is there any additional properties like peripheral properties to, to, to the uh, present commercial zones that, that are being targeted that, that maybe in prior years were residential, but really have no business being residential anymore because they're just surrounded by commercial orientation? Is, was, was the, the map expanding our capabilities as a town to approve some additional properties for development for commercial or mixed use? I, I think the answer to that question will be yes, that that's got to be part of the conversation. Uh, uh, I, I, I see a certain gentleman on the screen that's uh, uh, in Mr. Penzer that's been advocating for a very long time uh, that the depth of our commercial zoning is too shallow uh, along some of our major corridors to be effective and maybe we should look for opportunities to expand the depth or breadth of our commercial zoning to create some additional opportunity. Um, so I think the short answer is yes, how, how that plays out, I, I think for us remains to be seen, but I think that has to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Very good. So if I, I could just, also, my, yes. hi, if I could just say, oh, go ahead, Emmeline. Go ahead. Elite Fatherly here. Hi. Hi, Jim and Emmeline. Thanks for uh, presenting. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I just wanted to share some thoughts because I, I saw that the, the list of ideas um, about the food trucks and about expanding Sherman Green. Um, the first thing that came to mind when I saw the food trucks, I thought, well, good idea, but you know, that's also going to increase pollution. Um, I'm just wondering if there's some reassessment involving uh, these ideas because um, one of the ideas also that's been floating with the sustainable task force are like, uh, for example, a food co-op um, that could also be a solution to expanding the Sh uh, Sherman Green um, market because that would also stand as a year round opportunity. Um, uh, less uh, pricing for groceries also like, you know, could be a 1 stop shop for people. So they're not driving from here to there to get, you know, affordable produce. Um, and I just thought that I'd mention that because I thought, you know, the list looked pretty good, but it looked like there, would, there was room for a reassessment of that list. And also, I wanted to just mention, um. You mentioned some, I, I also want to give you feedback on the restaurant idea for um, that you mentioned about, you know, having some restaurants or a restaurant near the marina. Um, I wanted to find out, you know, maybe what are the 1st steps that we take when we're implementing these restaurants? Because I've seen in town that, you know, uh, be good. I, I, I could list a bunch of them that they come in they come and they go. So, so how are we making these selections? Because, um. We also have neighboring restaurants um, that are thriving in Westport and Darien, and you know I wonder if we can, you know, reach out to some of those communities to see if those businesses might work here too. Um, I was just wondering what kind of approach goes into this, and 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 you know how long does it take? Well, with with the respect to the idea of a restaurant in the marina area, and specifically I, I think the bigger question is is aside from who the operator might be you know there's a threshold question of whether or not it's it's the right idea um you know i've been here long enough to uh, remember when there was a uh, the playground that exists down in the jennings beach adjacent to the jennings beach parking lot was proposed um, you know, the reaction to that idea, uh, <laughs> you, you'd think it was a, 
um, you know, a commercial office building being proposed the way that, the, the, you know, there was neighborhood pushback and reaction to that. So I think that's a that's that that's an idea that has to be carefully um, um, searching for the right word here, but but vetted. <laughs> it's got it's got to go yeah vetted uh, per, you know uh, um, um, so there, there's got to be some buy into that and that's really more of a political leadership question is is to whether there's enough um, you know political support for the concept. Now, getting down on the ground in terms of how a, a restaurant operator can be successful, uh, I think is, is is a different thing. Um, you know, obviously, it's you know, um, and I'm not an expert in, in 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 that regard. But I think in terms of getting buy-in about concepts of leasing uh, or potentially leasing out town property for commercial use is is more of a political question, in, in my view, than, than anything else. If I could just add to, I think, I think the idea of a pop up, you know, so, for example, uh, 1 of the challenges of even doing any commercial down by the marina is it's in a flood zone. That's a fairly high flood zone. So the construction costs are going to be a lot higher for any permanent restaurant that wants to position themselves there. Um, so it's, it's a rather significant um, cost output for them. I think the idea and they've done this in other municipalities. I mean, as planners who are constructing a POCD, who are looking at potentially revising our regulations to provide more incentive within those regulations to the commercial marketplace. We really look sometimes to best practices as what they're doing in other places. And Mark can speak to this too, but you know, there have been extremely successful, um, especially in the summertime food truck festivals, where maybe they close down a portion of a street, for example, and um, it allows those restaurants to get a feel for, is their appetite here at a, at a relatively low cost output to them instead of doing like a full bricks and mortar kind of um, installation. So I, I think that we can also test the waters in that kind of way as other municipalities and commercial corridors have done to determine whether or not, you know, this is something that could be successful. Can our residential neighborhoods, neighbors who live in that area also deal with the seasonality of the excitement that this might bring to their neighborhood, but also the potential impacts. Um, so, you know, something like that, I think that's where I think folks in the workshops were really kind of excited about, ooh, maybe we could try it this way. Right, but I agree with you, but also with COVID now, I'm thinking like, who, you know, how are people going to um, react to like having a food truck? I mean, I, I just, that's just my opinion. I just, I just feel like no, that's, you're, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. You know. That idea because people might not be as receptive to it as they were before. There's no doubt about that. I agree completely that that COVID has changed business models in all respects. I'm not sure our public meetings are ever going to be the same again, uh, let alone the way folks do business uh, and feel comfortable about going to a restaurant or, uh, you know, hopefully in time we'll be back to some semblance of normalcy. But you're absolutely right that, that this pandemic has kind of put everything in a new light. Um, and so we need to kind of rethink you know, we think how we uh, go forward. Uh, Jim or Emmeline, uh, it, uh, much like how Uber has kind of changed the need for the parking requirements for development purposes for, uh, for restaurants, you, you might say that, that so did COVID. Uh, and I know that uh, as a town, we've been really, we've, we've tried to relax certain circumstances with, with uh, outdoor seating to allow these restaurants to to survive, uh, something tells me that that these relaxed uh, uh, regulations might actually be a little more of a way to go. Just moving forward, even after this all takes place, because it doesn't seem to have as big of an impact as what we expected it would be if we if we held them to those regulations. Can you comment about that? No, I agree. I agree with you, Kevin, completely. That, that the that the laboratory of this pandemic has has allowed us to see how a uh, a broader opportunity for outside dining uh, can help. Certainly, it's been well received, and I think going forward, I think it's likely that we are going to, at least at the staff level, uh, recommend for relaxed um, regulations. I mean, the whole concept of parking. Um, you know, again, to me, it's it's almost 
self-regulating, um, but it's hard for regulators, decision makers to, you know, the concern when, when a commission looks at a project is they don't want to create an off, you know, an unintended offsite impact. Um, and sometimes, yeah, we get a little conservative in that requirement. I agree with you there, there's been a national movement, uh, a lot of studies done uh, that talk about that we are over parked uh, all over the place. You know, it's not a one size fits all, uh, but you folks all know, and um, Beverly can certainly attest to, but there's always been a, a raging debate as to whether or not we have sufficient parking in our downtown. Um, you know, there seems to be a fair amount of supply. When you go, you can get a place to park. Yeah, you might not park, you know, three feet in front of the restaurant or store you want to go to, but you're going to generally find a place. Um, and so if there's, so, but, but I think the short answer is yes. I think there's some long-term sustainability to uh, relaxing parking requirements in general and for restaurants specifically. So if that, just taking that uh, one step forward, uh, uh, equalizing the regulations for parking for different types of uses, whether it's retail or restaurant or office, would that not be helpful for uh, property owners to be able to go and, and they could lease out property uh, without having to worry about going back to the town and trying to get uh, uh, approvals for that. It could just kind of be a straightforward, a straight line use. Yes, uh, again, there there was, uh, through our, the, the, the trans-oriented development study, that was a question that was put out for discussion and there seemed to be support uh, and I believe the plan recommends for consideration of equalizing, as you say, the, 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 the parking for restaurants for retail. So a, a, a commercial landlord doesn't have to jump through those hoops with a tenant if we're going from a, you know, from a, you know, clothing store to a cafe or a cafe to a clothing store. It, it, it reduces the barrier uh, for implementation. So, yeah, I think from a staff level we agree with you completely um we just need to roll out some, some options to, to to implement that but yes i think uh -huh. there's so how do we support you how can we help you get to to that well i think there will be some recommendations along those lines in the plan there already are in the in the transit oriented development plan um and so what we see is a lot of times the um you know as an example uh, we have uh, the a private development may be ahead of uh, our trust and the commission in implementation that they've got a plan that they want to put forward that is going to implement some of the recommendations that we've made. So it could be through a private application uh, that comes forth with a regulation amendment, or it would be the commission itself once we're done with this effort and we have a list of recommendations. All right, now we have to go back as action items and which of these are we going to implement in, uh, through regulatory change. If I you know, might as, add, as, that, that's also is something that this commission has done too, which is proposed uh, text amendments to the Planning and Zoning Commission. So that's a possibility as well. So, Mr. Chair, so, I, as I, a chair I just want to say that we're coming up on the hour, and uh, sure. so I just want to. It's not. This is a great conversation, so I, I'm willing to do that as long as as, as uh, commission members have time for, and Jim and Emily can share with us. So I just want to put that out there. I was just going to say I, I'm, I'm failing as as a, as a chairman to to uh, to to, to uh, keep track of the time. I could actually between Jim and Emily, I, I could really be talking about this all day. I think you guys are just terrific, uh, uh, but we probably do need to condense this at this point. So uh, I I think we're gonna we're gonna thank you very much for for spending the time with us this morning, and we probably have to go through and do the rest of our laundry list of of things uh, uh, for our uh, for for our agenda. So thank you both very much for being well, here today. We, we, uh, we appreciate the opportunity. And as we've kind of uh, been mired in all kinds of uh, uh, housing applications, it's, 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 a good, yeah, it's a good refresher for us to get us re-energized and focus on, on the task ahead. So we appreciate the opportunity for being with you this morning. Well, we wanna help out in any way we can. So just, just reach back to us where you see what we can help. Yeah, we, we sure will. We have a, uh, 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 you're, you're, we have a great relationship with Mark and deal with each other on a daily basis, and we are uh, look forward to working with you guys <laughs> down the road. Excellent. Thank you both very much. Mark, I'm going to hand it back Thank to you, you to go through it. some additional items. Yeah, I, I, you know, in, in the interest of time and ever, and I know uh, I want to be respectful, 
of uh, commission members who may have other appointments. Um, you know, there's certainly nothing that I need to uh, to spend much time talking about this morning. I can certainly share with all of you a written update on some of these things. The one thing I, I did want to point out before I ask Beverly if she had something she would like to add is that we're going through this uh, process with, with Metrocog, which is our regional planning agency uh, that's involved in updating a regional economic development strategy for the six town region of which Fairfield is a part. And they've uh, put forth a survey uh, that they've asked businesses and residents to fill out, which is the link is on the uh, town's website. And I'll certainly share that link with the commission members. So I'd ask you to share that with, with your contacts and colleagues um, and certainly fill out the, the survey itself. They're also trying to arrange some focus group sessions with uh, businesses that are in this area uh, to get some sense as to what their priorities and issues and needs are and how we can best support them as they as they try to uh, to prosper and grow and, and expand here. Um, and then at the same time, I'm working with Jim Emmeline and other members of our team to uh, identify any any constraints in terms of uh, economic development from an infrastructure standpoint and what types of infrastructure projects would be most helpful. And because part of the, uh, the advantage of doing a SEDS is that it opens up the opportunity to apply for uh, grants uh, through the Economic Development Administration, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, so a, a SEDS, which is really an eco a regional economic development plan, is uh, a precursor, a prerequisite to applying for those, those funds. Um, on a regional basis. So uh, we're going through that process. I'll again, share additional information with you in written form, but I did want to highlight, uh, highlight that effort that's underway. And uh, we um, certainly will keep you up, up to date or posted on that. Beverly, is there something you'd like to, uh, to add from the chamber's perspective? I'm sorry, we're compressing things a bit. Um, I think I'm all set. That was the one piece of the meeting today that I'm glad that you just addressed that because as it, um, as it services and what our priorities at the chamber will support that with Metro Cog as well. So I uh, just want to make sure that we're on the same page with regard to the priorities in town as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll share this with, uh, again, I can put this out in a, in a written update to the commission members, which I'll do by week's end um, as part of my uh, written report. And then uh, if, if anyone has any feedback on any of these items or, or um, uh, issues or, or questions, we'll be happy to take those uh, offline. So um, that, that's it. I, I thought I thought it was very helpful to have an update from Jim and Emmeline as to this um, the master the town's master plan, a plan of conservation development. It's a you know, we're required to do this every 10 years, but it really sets the framework uh, to guide uh, future development patterns, land use um, and development patterns in town for the next decade. Uh, so it's a it's an important document, and I thought just again um, I thought the, the discussion was 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 really good. So um, I agree. hopefully all of you Does, agree. I agree. Does anyone else have any uh, comments or quick questions before we uh, we draw closure to the the meeting? I know we're okay. a couple people right. drop off well, already. So there we go. Well, thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, a pleasure seeing each of you, and I hope to see you soon. Take care, okay, guys. I, uh, thank all right, thank you, thank you. Uh, move to adjourn. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Second. Uh, or, I think we're all set. I see. I see Mr. Foley uh, seconding, and so I think we're adjourned at nine thirty-two. Thank you, everyone, Excellent. for attending today. Thank you all very much. All right. Bye bye. Bye now.